Well, hi everyone. Last week I did a video about the massive road closures along I-40 in Western North Carolina. It's not improved very much in the 10 days since this hurricane went through the area on Friday, September 27th and Saturday, September 28th. But I wanna go through the information that I have right now and give a better idea in terms of what I think, what the recovery process could and should look like in this region. I mean, the amount of devastation is just total. Just widespread areas completely inundated with mud, water. Many of these towns are gonna to be wiped out for the immediate future if they ever recover. Communications were knocked out, water, electrical power. So before I get too deep into this video, the recovery efforts have a long way to go. There's many people still missing and unaccounted for. North Carolina DOT has this link on their website to donate to hurricane recovery. There's also many private charities that are doing an excellent job in supporting people here. It's, it's going to take a lot more effort and a lot more effectiveness to bring relief to these folks. Uh, for what it's worth, I'm going to donate all the AdSense revenue from this video uh, to this relief site. So everybody's focused on the hurricane itself. But as many of you reminded me, there were days of rain preceding this hurricane. So here's the path of the hurricane, Helene going through the region. Many of you pointed out correctly that what contributed so, to so much flooding after Hurricane Helene went through was the days of rain that they had leading up to the hurricane, or as I guess they refer to it in meteorology, a precursor event. So the ground was already saturated. Any new rainfall was gonna end up as runoff. And so the amount of runoff increased. Uh, there was a lot of flash flooding. It was a very difficult scenario that was set up by the weather pattern going into this hurricane. And with the communications being knocked out, the extent of the damage, as well as loss of life and injuries, really isn't well understood even 10 days after the hurricane. This was a recent headline, it said the current death tolls at 227 people. Unfortunately, that number is going to increase as more communication gets established. Here's a headline from the New York Times, hundreds of storm ravaged roads and no timeline for fixing them. There's also been a lot of complaints from politicians and just about everybody else about the lackluster federal response to this disaster. I'll let you make up your own mind about this. In general, I'll just say the federal response in situations like this is, and this is probably the most extensive amount of hurricane damage that's ever occurred in, in recent memory in the United States. But going back to Katrina and, and other major hurricanes, when has the federal response been timely and effective? I'll just put that question out there. And that's not to give anybody a pass. I think the federal bureaucracy has simply gotten too large. There's too much red tape, too many people. They just can't effectively, apparently, coordinate response to devastating events that were days in the making. So there's Current updates on the road conditions throughout Western North Carolina on the North Carolina DOT website. From the accounts I've seen, the North Carolina DOT has done an excellent job under the circumstances responding to this disaster, but again, there's a long way to go. Now I'm recording this video on Monday, October 7th, and my review of news sources up until now indicates that the transportation secretary has not personally visited these impacted areas, nor has the president, uh, although he did fly over these areas of North Carolina and perhaps Eastern Tennessee uh, a couple of days ago. This is in contrast to other disasters. For example, the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge, I believe the transportation secretary was there within a day or two talking about the forceful and full-throated federal response that the local community 
could count on in that disaster. But I want to play a section of an interview here that was conducted with WCNC out of Charlotte with the transportation secretary. All right, so give us an idea. What is a timeline for getting these roads, especially the, the major interstates like I-40, I-26, back up and running? Yeah, I-40 is a clear priority. Uh, there are also still parts of I-26 that are compromised, although I was pleased to see how much of that uh, got back uh, uh, up and running by yesterday. Uh, we estimate over 400 roads still closed and uh, are engaging with North Carolina's DOT to address them. Uh, it, it's difficult to overstate. Uh, how profound and widespread the damage is here. And so there's a lot of prioritization that's going to have to go on. Our department's role is uh, largely to make sure that funding is not a barrier. So North Carolina's DOT has signaled to us that they are going to file for what's called emergency relief. That opens up uh, a, uh, a fund that we can use uh, to provide some of the dollars to get that done. Uh, and that can go to everything from uh, preparation and certain kinds of, uh, uh, of debris removal to uh, getting on with the, the reconstruction. The latest estimates I've seen from uh, North Carolina's DOT suggest it is uh, months at minimum before there is a full restoration of I-40, but we have seen in uh, many disasters around the country how temporary solutions uh, can be applied to try to get vehicles moving. That's part of what will uh, provide technical assistance on working with the DOT uh, in state to get as much uh, back to normal as quickly as possible. So I wanted to play that whole segment to just put things into context. So what the transportation secretary is saying is, we're here to process the request for funding from North Carolina Department of Transportation and presumably Tennessee Department of Transportation for their issues. But again, North Carolina, Western North Carolina, bore the brunt of this disaster. And if you look at Google Maps, initially they showed these road closures lasting a few weeks, in some cases lasting a full year. But now they've updated to indicate that some of these sections of I-40 won't be open until 2028. So I'm not sure where they're getting that information. That is too long. That, that can't be allowed to occur, in my opinion. I think this, these highways need to be restored to full functionality within months. And I recognize that's going to be a tall order. So I looked at Google Maps and Google Earth, and I thought, well, is it because there were bridges that were taken out? And it's not inconceivable that it would take two or three years to replace a bridge. But as far as I can tell, these sections along I-40 that Google says will be closed until 2028 are roadway fill sections next to the Pigeon River. So I don't quite understand why that would take three years to restore those embankment sections. But again, it's gonna be critically important to reestablish all the infrastructure in the area and the highway in infrastructure is an important component of the overall infrastructure needs in this region. There's an article in the Washington Post that talks about of 11,000 excess deaths occur on average from their survey of 500 hurricanes. And so excess deaths are those related to the after effects of a hurricane and not due to the immediate event. People not having access to medical care. People not receiving their maintenance medications in a timely fashion, such as insulin. So again, reestablishing the highway infrastructure here is absolutely critical. This is the current map, again, as of October 7th. Pretty much says, stay out of Western North Carolina. Essential travel only. And Aside from the suffering that's going on in this region by the individuals that were impacted by it, this is going to have a huge ripple effect for the supply chain in this country. I was looking at what it would take to travel to Upland, South Carolina. As I mentioned, I've been there in the past, and I went through this I-40 route. And to get there now, the most effective route is going through Atlanta. So you can imagine over-the-road trucks, Going through Georgia, and, and Georgia has some of the most congested highways in the country, based on my experience, it's going to be a nightmare for people on the roads and particularly for the truckers. Now, I do want to acknowledge the efforts of, um, I know there's many, many people, I, I couldn't mention all the groups who have been very effective in jumping right in to lend much needed relief to this situation. Dolly Parton has partnered with Walmart 
Together, they've donated $12 million to Hurricane Helene relief efforts. I understand there's at least 100 Walmart parking lots that are being utilized for staging and relief areas throughout this region. Elon Musk has sent Starlink satellite receivers to restore internet service to many people in this region. And there's also a story about a group of volunteers that uh, have banded together to get people evacuated and to get much needed supplies, food and water into these areas. Uh, this group is referred to as Operation Hilo. So I'm gonna talk about what I think the government should be doing, the federal government in particular, to facilitate rapid reconstruction and restoration of the highway infrastructure in this area. From what I can tell, as I mentioned, a lot of the problem areas has to do with erosion and just elimination of large sections of roadway embankment. So that material is gonna to have to be trucked in. It's, you can't barge it in, you can't bring it in by, by aircraft. It has to be trucked in. And I think they need to look at trying to get a quarry operation up and running near this area to cut down on the transportation distance and start producing material now so that when other areas of roadway are opened up, trucks can deliver this material to these zones that need to be reconstructed along the Pigeon River. This is some drone footage that I had commissioned in Wyoming, just shows you a very limited rock processing operation, but this is essentially out in the middle of nowhere on the Teton Pass. So you can set up aggregate processing facilities in remote areas. Also, I think some consideration needs to be made about constructing worker camps. They do it all the time in the oil industry, in the pipeline industry, where you have work done in a remote area and people might work two weeks on and have two weeks off. Of course, you would have additional shifts of people so they have continuous coverage of labor for this construction work. But again, I would hope that somebody's looking at a way of staging workers relatively close to these areas that need to be reconstructed. Also, in terms of medical care, I was in the Naval Reserves over 30 years ago, and at one point uh, during the first Gulf War, I was sent out to redeployment training for a 500-bed hospital unit. I was in the Civil Engineering Corps, and the units were CB units, and they could put together a 500-bed field hospital with water, power, sewage, operating rooms in very short order. And again, I don't know all the ins and outs, but I think an executive order to get the Navy or the National Guard or somebody like that to set up these 500 bed field hospitals, as I assume they still exist, in these impacted areas, I think are, are seriously needed at this point. This is an article out of Wikipedia that mentions how these field hospitals were set up during the uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield operation. But again, the amount of water that's moved through this area and the resulting damage is just mind boggling. I mean, it took decades to build this highway system throughout this region, and it's gonna take a lot of time to rebuild it. I know some of you have mentioned that they should look at alternative siting, more tunnels, things of that nature, so that this area is hardened as it were, in case there's a future event like this. I don't know what this event rates in terms of recurrence intervals. I read one article that suggested it as a one in 1,000 event, but I simply don't know. But I don't think there's any time right now to, quote, do it right. I mean, this is part of a system, so they got to get it up and running to get traffic going through. But I think it's a point well taken that perhaps they can look at a long-term project for tunneling, either to reroute sections of roadway, or to create storage for floodwaters. You know, a number of cities have constructed tunnels to be compliant with the Clean Water Act in the United States so that they don't have combined discharge of stormwater and untreated sewage in major rivers throughout the country. So the idea is they have to store the floodwaters from their stormwater system and release it slowly so that it can be handled by the wastewater treatment plant. There's also extensive damage to dam infrastructure. This is the dam for Lake Lure. It sustained extensive damage. Of course, it was in 
poor condition from what I understand even before Hurricane Helene passed through. So again, upgrading dam and levee infrastructure is going to be very, very important to reduce flooding from future rain events. But the other problem with this storm was the high winds that were produced and so many trees were pushed down into the raging waters that a lot of areas are just blocked up with not only mud, but, but trees as well. North Carolina DOT apparently has many of their own forces that can do construction work. I understand as many as 1,600 North Carolina Department of Transportation employees are involved in relief efforts right now. You can see them loading out here from a maintenance location. So I'll continue to follow this story as new developments occur. I want to send a shout out to the channel members, as well as those of you who provided super thanks. I'm going to roll credits at the end, but that's a great way to support the channel. Thanks for watching, everyone, and please stay tuned for future videos.